You've probably heard that this is the year for the 2020 census, but how much do you really know about it? Well, whatever you know, you'll be able to find out more on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Every 10 years, the U.S. conducts the census, which is required by law as a way of getting an accurate count of the number of people living in the country. The very first census was conducted in the U.S. in 1790, and it has been carried out every decade since then. There are a lot of misconceptions about the census, and this year especially, there might be a lot of fears surrounding it. On this show, I'll speak with three guests who are involved in outreach activities to dispel fears regarding the census and to encourage as many people as possible to participate. Seated to my left is Ruben Avila, who has been a guest on my show before. Ruben is currently the Director of Career Center Services for Job Train, a nonprofit career training center in Menlo Park. Ruben has gradually climbed the career ladder in the 24 years that he has worked with the organization. Seated to my right is Jonathan Garcia, who is a senior attorney at the Legal Aid Society of San Mateo County. Jonathan is also an attorney with LIBRA, which stands for Linking Immigrants to Benefits, Resources, and Education. He is bilingual in English and Spanish, and his main area of practice is immigration law. Seated to my right beside Jonathan is Walter Manofetoa. Let me do that again. Walter Manofetoa. <laughs> Walter is the Census Community Outreach Specialist at Job Train and also a Community Engagement Specialist for the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center. Well, Welcome to the show. It's a thrill to have you here. Walter, mm -hmm. give me your last name. Did I <laughs> <laughs> pronounce um, that? <laughs> yeah. It's Manu Fetoa. Ah, mm -hmm. Jonathan, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Manu Fetoa. Yeah. Close. Close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Manu Fetoa. Uh -huh. yeah. Manu Fetoa. Yeah. Well, I, I tried it twice. Mm. <laughs> Does it mean anything in particular? Um, no, it's just um, my the lineage of my father's side. Um, so there's this thing in our Tongan culture where um, our last name is passed down from a very uh, strong lineage. And so that's just the last name that represents my dad's um, side of the family. Yeah. Well, it sounds very unique Thank you, yeah. for English ears, not for Tongan ears. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Well, I mentioned uh, that you're all involved in outreach activities. Mm -hmm. So how did you get started with outreach activities for the census? Uh, well, in my case, um, um, Job Train applied for a grant uh, that was being uh, uh, RFP'd through San Mateo County to do census work in the region because San Mateo County realizes the importance of participating in the census and, and what, what it means to the community at large with funding and and representation and so forth and so they wanted to really get the hard to count communities and, and where job trees are located in East Menlo Park, East Palo and East Menlo Park, the Bell Haven area are communities that were considered a hard to count communities because of the immigration immigrant population. Um, Jonathan, Ruben just talked about hard to count populations. Does that factor into why you're working on the census? How did you get involved? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I got involved. The opportunity came up as well, working um, with Legal Aid. Um, we applied for the grant to be legal counsel for um, the organizations working on the census. And for me personally, I think uh, the census really resonated because 
you know, I, I, I'm an immigration attorney, and lots of times my clients um, feel like they don't, they're not important, like they don't matter. Do and they really so feel they don't matter? Sometimes they do, because um, I think just everything that's been going on the last few years in the media, um, the rhetoric that's out there, um, they're just very afraid right now. And so usually once we're able to, uh, I'm able to help them with the legal um, issue or even when I'm not able to help them, they always appreciate um, me taking the time just to sit down with them and at least listening to them. And so um, a lot of them wish they could vote. A lot of them can't because they need to be um, U.S. citizens to vote. And so this is one way that I feel I can help in giving them the voice that um, that I think they deserve. Sure. Now, Walter, oh, Pacific Islanders, <clears throat> do they think they don't count in any way? Or they don't matter? Um, they matter. Um, and I think uh, census plays a huge part in um, highlighting the importance of data because data uh, really um, gives us the opportunity to advocate for our community. And so when our community is undercounted, um, that means we're underrepresented. Um, there's not enough resources for our community. So this type of work in the Pacific Island community is very needed. It's like we need it, we need it a lot, and we need a lot of people advocating for this type of work. And so when um, Job Train did an outreach at CSM with the Pacific Island Community Count Committee. What's CSM? CSM stands for the College of San Mateo. And uh, Job Train did a presentation or did outreaching for uh, somebody to work for this position that I'm at now at Job Train. So I applied and I got involved. And um, when I started at uh, Job Train, it was beginning of December. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn about census. I started to learn about data. I started to learn about misrepresentation. And I started to learn about a lot of things that um, that that census impacts our community with. And so it's been a good journey so far. And so that's how I first got involved with census. Sure. Um, Ruben, you, this isn't your first time working with the census, no. is it? You worked, what, 10 years ago? Um, t oh, going on, this is my third census. Ah. Yeah, and, uh, but the previous two I did really just uh, aided the uh, census in providing space at job training and coordinating with uh, the outreach efforts and helping get the word out. But uh, at this level, it's my first time with the county's deep involvement in making sure that the messaging is consistent and that there, uh, there's a consorted effort to kind of make sure people have, are well-informed, well-rounded, and make good choices about participating. What differences have you seen in the three times that you've been working with the census? Uh, this time around, it's very intense, very involved. Uh, uh, there are definitely strategies that the county's looking at, San Mateo County, to, uh, to make sure that uh, you know, we, we leave uh, no rock unturned. We're looking at making sure that people are well informed, that information is provided to everybody, and they make, you know, they understand the implications of participating and, and also the implications of not participating. So they're really making a, a real big push to make sure people are, are educated, are knowledgeable about what the census means. You, you may not necessarily vote, but you can definitely participate in the census. Sure. Now, since you're all involved in outreach activities, and you probably have already started, what type of feedback have you noticed with any of the people you've been talking to? Have they expressed concerns or yeah. wanted more information or, or what, what have you seen so far? So one of the events that Job Train um, hosted a couple weeks ago was um, this thing called Under the, uh, On the Table. Mm -hmm. um, it was through uh, Silicon Valley Found Foundation, Foundation Community. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's basically a facilitation of discussion on about civic engagement, um, but the theme for job trains uh, facilitation was uh, the 2020 census. And so some of the, the feedback that I was getting from our participants were um, uh, this type of lack of knowledge how to navigate the legal system and how to advocate better for the community. And um, another thing that the participants were talking about was uh, they do not trust the government. And then there's this sense of fear that's been uh, perpetuated by the rhetoric that we see from this administration. And so those are very valid um, uh, um, thoughts and feelings in our community. Um, but we also 
um, educated them about the census and why it's important and how it can benefit our community and be very inclusive uh, in, in terms of civic engagement, whether you are documented or not. And so um, we highlighted some of the fears, but we also educated and gave them knowledge about the census. Do you think they um, were convinced? Um, I, I don't have an answer if they were convinced, but I know that it's, it's a process, right? And I know that um, from the beginning of the facilitation, there was this uncertainty of uh, the 2020 census, but by the end of the facilitation, they were um, more motivated to participate in the 2020 census. That's good. Yeah. I am just, I, I, I was kind of startled, Jonathan, when you said people, the immigrants, some of them that you deal with, don't feel that they count. They don't feel that they count in what ways? Well, um, There's a lot of focus on them right now I, from this administration, yes. so for the administration, they count. <laughs> they count, but maybe not in the way that um, they feel that they are important. I think, um, you know, without getting in, into the weeds too much with immigration, everything is very slow right now. And, um, you know, a lot of times, for example, if they're waiting for a certain kind of benefit, that's going to improve their lives. That extended wait period for us, for example, might not sound um, so tough, but for someone that's you know living paycheck to paycheck and uh, lives in the Bay Area, that's very expensive. It's it's a monumental task. I honestly um, and most of them are living paycheck to paycheck. Yes, if that um, in blue collar with families, positions. yeah, um, <laughs> with families renting, um, you know, the whole family living in one room or one small studio, and so. Um, I think they they just you know feel like they're they're being paid attention to, but not in the in the right way, um, because they are valuable members of society and um, they you know they work they pay their taxes um, and they're just trying to improve their lives. Well, we talk about misconceptions about mm -hmm. the census, and we're talking about hard to count communities. So I'm wondering. There are probably myths, too, about these hard-to-count communities, or myths about immigrants. Are there any myths that jump out at you that you think should be discussed? I think the, the big uh, misconception is um, the government's going to use this data to, to yeah. depart me. To, you know, it's going to be used against me. Uh, it's going to affect me <coughs> personally. And, you know, where's this information going? How's it going to be used? And that's a big one, and that's some of the apprehension people have is um, they're asking a lot of personal questions. And they're, they're, they're really not in-depth questions, but they can be imposing when you think about Kind you know, of asking, intrusive, yeah, like how, how many, many people in exactly, your family. And what's their date of birth and, uh -huh. and their gender and so on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty intrusive. So people are wondering, what are you going to do with all this information? And, and yeah. so you know, part of Walter's job, our job, is to make sure that people understand that uh, there are laws that prohibit this information to be shared with with no other department within the federal government, the uh, Department of Homeland Security cannot access this information. Um, which other ones they said, Walter, remember? Uh, uh, Title 13, the U.S. Code. Yeah. So it, it, you're, you're, it's your, your personal information that you, sh that you share with the census cannot be shared with any other government agency, right. um, such as the CIA, ICE, um, FBI. So it's, um, it's illegal for, for the, the, the U.S. Census uh, Bureau to <coughs> share that type of information. Do you know, um, some <clears throat> people might think, mm -hmm. well, Trump could use an executive order, mm -hmm. right? And convince um, those in the Census Bureau to turn over the information. In fact, I think his administration has asked mm -hmm. or said that they think they're in, it's entitled to the information. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not aware of that. Um, but I did want to mention that the, the census it has nine questions, but none of them ask about citizenship status. Yeah. So that's a very important clarification is that there is no citizenship question at all on the census. And so um, the names and ages and dates of birth alone don't allude to, hey, this doesn't mean that somebody is here, et cetera. And so that's one, um, I think going back to the myth question, because I was thinking about this when you asked, is there is no citizenship question. There was talk of 
the administration wanting to put it on the census, uh, but there were lots of lawsuits, and ultimately, that's a big victory that I think um, uh, a lot of people sh definitely should know about is that there is no citizenship question, and so not not once will the census ask, you know, what is your provide your social security number or provide your evidence of residency or anything to that matter. Myths, misconceptions, are there myths or misconceptions about the census, about immigrants, about people feeling that they're not important and they don't count? There are some people that think that, well, I can't vote, so therefore I can't do the census also. That's a big misconception in the community. Um, there are also the myths in the community about, well, I'm living with my brother-in-law and, and I have a family and, I, and so the census is only going to count my mm -hmm. brother-in-law and his family and not me. Or I don't count my, you know, yeah. my brother-in-law. It's a separate family. So people have to understand it's the whole household that has to be counted, not just the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the address and the, and, the, and, the, and the name on the envelope with, with the information on the census that you get. It's everybody that lives in that household yeah. uh, April 1st. So. so April 1st is the day it starts? Um, actually, it starts uh, March 12. Every household, every address will receive a mail um, with the ID number um, that will give them instructions on, to go online and complete the census online. Um, if, if your household does not get counted or did not participate yet, um, they will, the U.S. Census Bureau will send out reminders. And then somewhere in April, you'll receive a, a paper form and if your household did not uh, uh, participate in the census that, um, by, by that time, um, you'll have people knocking on your door in May. But my pitch is that I use when I do outreach is that if you don't want anybody knocking on your door in May, fill it out in March. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, yeah, so that that's, this actually starts in um, March 12th. Um, but, but the census uh, count actually already started, in, especially in the rural area like Alaska. So it's already, um, they're already counting people in Alaska right now. So what do you say to people? For example, Jonathan, the people that you work with who all might be living in one room um, and working three jobs to get by, how are they expected to go online? I mean, a lot of people in low-income communities and hard-to-count communities yeah. don't have access to computers. Yeah. Is that true? And yet they're expected to go online and fill out the census? Yeah, uh, that isn't the only way they can fill it out. Um, as Walter said, they can actually do the paper form if they feel more comfortable They'll responding get it in to the, the mail. paper form. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a lot of, uh, we'll have, especially here in San Mateo County, what's called a QAC, which stands for Questionnaire Assistance Center. And at these centers, um, you know, volunteers and workers will help them actually uh, actually help them how to get on the computer and they still have to write in their answers themselves but they'll be there to guide them every step of the way and there's actually even an option where uh, someone can call in right. and they'll have you know instructions available in multiple languages and um, so there's definitely plenty of plenty of ways and also going back to the myths I think a big one is people say this is gonna take way too long yeah. <laughs> but I tell people <laughs> it's literally 10 questions that it went up from nine. Yeah, well, it's nine to ten questions. I think it depends. Um, How many at you your family? Because you got to get yeah. each person has to have a name, date of birth, and gender. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you were going to say continue. Um, it, it doesn't take up that 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 yeah, long. Yeah, I mean, ten questions. We say it'll probably take about ten minutes, but it's going to impact the next ten years of. Mm -hmm. So let's of talk your about life. those questions. Mm -hmm. There is the name. There is the birth date. The people in the family. The gender. Mm -hmm. Male, female, only male, female. Yeah. Only male, um, female. Yeah. This, this binary. Census. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. The, the next one, it'll be different. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. Race. Yes, there is race. In yes. And what kind of categories? They have. Uh, we saw it today. They have the breakdown uh, for a variety of different categories of ethnicity, but there's only like for race. It's it's it's, it's African American. Uh, white and uh, Latino a, or no, Hispanic, a, Asian, um, Asian, a, yeah, Asian, yeah. and yeah. also uh, uh, Native Hawaiian. But so it's Native Hawaiian, Chamorro, Samoan, um, and then other Pacific Islanders. Yeah, yeah. So we have a poster that shows different races 
that says on the poster, if we can see it, they can pull it up in the, in the that's the one. Mm -hmm. So that kind of illustrates some of the different groups or ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Anything you, that jumped out at you in terms of that poster that you might want to comment on? I, th I think it highlights um, our changing demographics in the United States. Um, if, 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 you, if you look at like the census from the 1990, 2000, 2010, um, and, then 20, and then, you know, we're gonna now look at you know, 2020, um, the populations are always shifting in the chain, uh, the, the ethnic groups are always changing. And so um, it's important that we get counted so that the right representation represents specific groups and localities in our country. Do you know, I think that is just such an important comment because when you talk about the changing demographics, I think that's almost at what's at the heart of Trump's, the Trump administration trying to deny more immigrants yeah. from coming into the country and pushing out those who are mm -hmm. currently in the country because of those changing demographics. Mm -hmm. And voter suppression, it seems to me, could be um, one of the reasons to to withdraw or make sure that people from other ethnicities do not vote mm -hmm. Hmm, to mm -hmm. get representation. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Because that clearly does, that poster represent changing demographics, doesn't it? Uh, what some of the concerns and fears might be. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. California is the most proactive state, one of the most proactive states in the union right now. We're deeply involved in, uh, in pushing information out and uh, about the, why the census is important to the, the communities, the counties, and so forth. On the other hand, you have a state like Texas where they're doing very little for the census. So there's, you know, there's that, you know, you can clearly see where people, where, what states feel it's, it's important to, to participate in the census and, and get um, the, the numbers in and get the representation and the funding that's needed sustain these communities? Well, it's my understanding in California, each person is worth from like 1200 to $1,500. A year? Yes, mm -hmm. when they're counted. Now, I would think even in Texas, while they might not be doing a lot, so you say mm -hmm. that they would too get money on the basis of the number of sure. people who are counted in Texas, mm -hmm. right? But they're not going to go out of their way to count everybody. But maybe to count certain groups, not certainly not those who have been traditionally underrepresented. Exactly. So what we're talking about is why it's so important for people to participate in the census. Now you had mentioned in the group today, uh, what group? We have some photos from the meeting today, and we can start looking at some of them and then you can put in your comments. I don't think you were there, Jonathan, but Walter, you were there and mm -hmm. you were there, Ruben. So if you could bring up uh, some of the other photos and we can talk about the meeting. So Ruben, Walter, what was that meeting about today? Who held it? Um, <clears throat> so was it held by the county? It was held by uh, United Way. United Way. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, it was training um, a lot of the organizations who are funded um, by the county or was it funded or United Way, or United Way um, just giving them um, training on how to answer frequently asked questions in the community so um, they gave us training on uh, canvassing and then gave us training on uh, the What's the, the kiosk or mm -hmm. the questionnaire, questionnaire center. Center. Mm -hmm. centers? Correct. So um, they gave us um, information on how to operate um, th that type of center and um, how to assist uh, community members that are participating in, in getting counted on, online. We can see the next, uh, the next slide. Canvassing, you mentioned canvassing. What mm -hmm. does canvassing consist of? So canvassing is uh, going door to door in the community and uh, trying to get people counted in the 2020 census. Or encourage them. And encourage them, encourage them, encourage them. Oh. Um, and so there's certain uh, things that we need to be aware of and make sure that the person that's knocking on your door um, is uh, working for the U.S. Census Bureau, right? Well, yeah, I was or going or to... Or about the volunteers. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask about that. How, how would people know 
I mean, anybody could knock on the door and say, I'm yeah. from the census, so how? Well, well, Walter was talking about the, the canvassing. The canvassing? Has to do with just uh, informing the community the census will come in, here's some information on the census. We, Passing uh, out uh, leaflets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But when the actual, when, when a person uh, has not done the online uh, census or done the phone call census, uh, then uh, um, June 1st, they'll come knocking on your door. Or May. Uh, May 1st, yeah, they'll come knocking on your door. And and when and they, uh, that's called a numerator, and and they're supposed to have ID, a bag, a certain color shirt. Uh, so we're going to get the the, the p specifics about how they're going to look. Uh, I think next month, so we can share that. Sure. With the so community. that people will know specifically if someone knocks on their door, right. and no one will knock on their door unless they haven't already submitted a census form. If they have not. Yeah. yeah. If they have not submitted a census for it, yeah. well then someone will. We'll knock on your so door the door best door. way to not have anyone knocking on your door, door, I think you <laughs> might, one of you might have said it, is to submit that census for yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, I think one of the big pieces of information that people should know and understand is anybody from the census is never going to ask for your social security, right. any kind of money, yeah. any kind of banking information, any kind of financial information. Yeah. Uh, because it doesn't cost to participate in the census. Mm -hmm. It's it's completely free. Um, and so that's one of the things that they should definitely be aware of. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's it's like anything else. If, you know, you have a question, they can call, um, you know, anyone. And, and as Ruben said, they're going to have IDs. And I believe this year um, uh, the census even has a number where people can call and verify the worker. And so that's oh, something that good. can also help. You know, you said it doesn't cost. And I'm thinking if people are leery about uh, participating in the census, certainly if they feel they have to pay for it. <laughs> that <would> Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's no exchange of money at mm -hmm. all in oh. any way. So no scammer. I can't even imagine how that might operate. Well, it might happen. We don't know. How, we don't how know. a yeah. scammer could say you have to pay. It's so important if you're worth $1,200 or $1,500. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're not going to get that money. Yeah. So we're talking about people, each person who submits a form for the census, talking about their family, how that form in each person involved is worth at least twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for the state of California, mm -hmm. but that person doesn't get the money directly. They get it indirectly, and in, in, how in services, in parks, and roads, and and um, um, healthcare, and uh, uh, other public services, in a multitude of different ways. They get the, the the money comes back into the community, and it benefits the whole community, not the individual, but the, the individual benefits too by the, the increase in services and, and, and other things that come with it. Yeah. So do you really think that we're going to see increases in services? <clears throat> I do. I mean, the way I explain it to people is if a community representative is out there asking for more money, it's very easy. The first question the government asks is, okay, why do you need more money? What's the answer to that going to be? Because we have yeah. this many people. And so the first thing that might pull up is, well, let's see your census results. And so it's a very first step in trying to show right. that you do have people that need services. Right. And that's the way I explain it to people is anytime anyone's going to be asking for money for the community, um, it's going to be very hard if you say, I need money, let's say, for example, for 100 people. And they say, well, you only your census showed that you only have 20 people living here. And so I think. That's a very general way of explaining it, but I think that's um, a good way of, of telling people that the represent their numbers do matter and the representation does matter. Yeah, yeah. and I'm thinking even on the political level, sure. uh, I heard something about California maybe losing a representative so, because the population is declining with mm -hmm. more people moving out because of the cost of living. Have you heard anything mm -hmm. like that? Well, mm -hmm. That. That kind of goes to the myth, and what Ruben was alluding to earlier is that uh, California does stand to lose a lot in the census, and, and that's why um, I think it's not coincidence that this administration wanted to have the citizenship question on there, because California is one of the states with the, major, the majority number of immigrants, the most immigrants, 
and so and voted Democratic too in the last election. Correct, <laughs> correct, yeah. And most elections, you know, it's a very Democratic state, and so you know the government thinks that if they can put enough fear and enough yeah. people don't participate, if they can get back a few Senate seats, those Senate seats will then go to another state. And of course, I think they're kind of chipping away, but ultimately you can see California lose some Senate seats to other states that uh, are more favorable to this administration, you could say, you know, like Texas or mm -hmm. other states, for well, example. Well, you know, so it's, it's interesting, too, because you talked about Texas not mm -hmm. doing that much when it comes to right. census. Mm -hmm. But I think it's Texas, it's Florida, it's California, and perhaps New York that have the biggest immigrant populations. Mm -hmm. True. So those states have the most to lose in terms of money if the immigrants in those states are not counted. Yeah. And, and at a micro level, San Mateo County, and that's why we're so focused on East Palo Alto because it's part of San Mateo County, but if you look around San Mateo County, you go to the grocery store, um, you know, you look around you, it's full of immigrants. And the majority of our, um, uh, well, I shouldn't say the majority, but a lot of our, our population here in San Mateo County is, is immigrants. So it's mm -hmm. very easy to see just even here in our own community. Yeah, I want to just add to that. So if, for example, if there's an increase of population in, in, in just San Mateo County, the, the, what comes after the census overcomes, you know, following the census is the redrawing of districts. And so if there's an undercount in a specific place that had an increase of population, that means that district is not going to represent that population. And so if um, there are certain rhetorics that perpetuate fear, those immigrant pop populations might not participate and then there might, there's not going to be an accurate representation for a certain district. Yeah. Well, it makes a whole lot of sense, but <laughs> will the people you talk to accept that uh, and, and feel encouraged or empowered enough to really be counted? I, that's, I think that's, that's, that highlights the important work of community relationships. And, you know, um, you know Job Train has been working close with one East Palo Alto, um, East Palo Alto Center for Community Media, Libre, um, and also with our regional partners with PCRC, uh, Nuestra Casa. So when community uh, organizations who have been in the community for a long time um, the community members trust those um, those spaces. We would hope so, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, because there's been, uh, you know, for example, Job Train has a certain relationship uh, with uh, other CBOs, community-based organizations, East Palo Alto. Um, it, we have a better chance of outreaching to uh, the community at large. Yeah. We talked about fears and misconceptions in terms of immigrant populations, and I'm wondering. Does it go a little deeper than that, where there might be more things people from the Hispanic community, the Latino community might be concerned about that might differ from concerns that those from the Pacific Islander community that might have uh, their concerns? So do you think there might be differences in terms of the level of concerns or the type of concerns? Well, I think for the Latino community, it is is coming uh, um, into the light from the shadows. I think a lot of immigrants are fearful because the focus has been uh, on, on the immigrants who are undocumented and there's reluctancy to step forward and, and, and be counted. There's a reluctancy to, to participate in anything that has to do with uh, becoming more visible in the community. And I think that's the fear many have is that, again, w you can tell me that it can't be used against me, but uh, how can I be assured that it won't be used against me? You know, it's, uh, they can, uh, easily equate uh, an ICE invasion a year from now on, well, I took the census, that's why the, you know, I, the invasion took place. Um, so um, it, it's, 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 it's difficult because of the, the stigma, I think because of the, uh, uh, the, the whole political climate and the focus, you know, immigrants have, uh, the negative focus they received uh, under this administration and, and, and how much of the negative highlight that they've been, uh, been uh, put upon them. And you know, when we talk about immigrant populations, a lot of people think primarily of Latinos, mm -hmm. and yet there are an awful lot of other immigrants in, these, in this country from Asia, from Africa, that are very much affected. Do you 
find in the work that you do, Jonathan, that you're counseling people from various uh, ethnicities? All around the world. It's very surprising. Um, I've helped people from, you know, Asia, South America, you know, even places. Um, one thing that surprised me being here, I've been working in legal aid for a little over two years now, is uh, there's a lot of Brazilians, mm -hmm. for example, um, um, uh, people from Latin American countries that people might not think are, are um, you know, in our community. But as you mentioned, um, you know, we have a lot of, of, of um, tech companies out here, for example, and a lot of them, um, you know, bring engineers, workers from, from all over the world. But um, I would say it's it's it varies. It's that's amazing. It's from everywhere, yeah. Um, each with each of those you talk about mm -hmm. having the same concerns of mm -hmm. not counting or being afraid. The Brazilians, for instance, or Southeast Asians, they all share those concerns. I think being afraid is definitely one of the main um, concerns that they have. Um, being afraid of being deported. Yes, and even a lot of times, um, you know, with the rhetoric that's out and about right now is even people that have a valid legal status are still afraid because they're saying, what's going to happen in a year if this expires? Or, um, you know, if I do something that, you know, for, for example, they're completely entitled to do, but um, they, they want to take someone, they want to take like some... What? Talk about something that people are entitled to do that they're afraid to do. I think, and, and, yeah. and, and you know, we had talked about mm -hmm. not we talked about, but the whole issue of public charge. Correct. And and maybe in talking about it, you might get into that that things that people are genuinely entitled to. Correct. That they are foregoing yes. out of fear. Yeah, and that's one thing that uh, Libre has done, which is um, you know our our collaborative uh, as part of Legal Aid is. We've done so much work and continue to do so much work around public charge because we want people to be informed instead now, of I, panicking. Explain yeah. public charge. A so little public bit. charge is uh, pretty much it's something that's been around for a long time, but this administration um, now has changed the definition for it to be broader and it, for it to include more. Um, uh, how should I say it? it they're brought in the definition, as you could say. And so what this has created is a lot, a lot of fear, which is what their um, intent is, because it all goes to the public benefits that people are using. Um, and Like food stamps. Food stamps. Or aid to pregnant women or aid to families. Correct, Medi-Cal, emergency Medi-Cal, um, CalWorks, CalFresh, Section 8 housing, for example. So. A public benefit is any kind of benefit that someone receives on behalf of the government. Sometimes they're on the state; they're from the state of California, the benefit, and sometimes the benefit's federal. And so we've done a lot of work, and um, I think just overall, it's just been a lot of fear. Free lunches for children. Correct. School lunches. I think um, there's pre to five programs here in California. Um, ACE is another California program. And ACE stands for? Um, it's San Mateo's, San Mateo County's local medical um, program that they use. Um, and so it's things like that where people, for example, we have a lot of mixed status families. What that means is that the parents may be immigrants, but the children are U.S. citizens. And the U.S. citizens, as a matter of law, are entitled to these benefits, but the parents are very afraid because of the rhetoric that they disenroll or they get off benefits. And, and that's kind of said, really, because there are people who really need the assistance. And having children go without lunches, for instance, when they're entitled to lunches. So you were talking about some of those programs and benefits that people would go without that they're entitled to. Correct. Yes. Um, and it's like you said, it forces people to choose between uh, having the basic necessities that will help them make ends meet living here in the Bay Area, especially here in San Mateo County, or you know, getting off of something that's not going to affect them in any way, but just because they're so scared, they'd rather just you know, disenroll, which is sad. So 
Walter, Jonathan just talked about the, the groups of people across the board in terms of ethnicities mm -hmm. who are affected and very much concerned. Some of the things he mentioned, does that apply to the Pacific Islander community? What might be some of the biggest fears that you've encountered? I think in what I've encountered in terms of outreaching with uh, my Pacific Islander community, um, there, there's a big, big di di disconnection, big disconnection between um, how the census relates to people like right now. And so, um, you know, part of my job, you know, in outreaching is, is trying to make the census relate to people's lives, like educating them on how those resources impacts them, their families, um, Head Start, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, all of these important um, social services um, are programs that I use to, um, to advance the, 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 the the census um, information with the Pacific Islander community. Um, when Pacific Islanders um, migrated to uh, the United States, a lot of the places in, specific in the Bay Area that were able to retain culture and community were churches. And so um, a lot of the churches in, in, you know, in the Bay Area with, with, that have uh, like Tongans and Samoans um, in their congregation, um, are the places that I tend to go to for outreaching. Um, and uh, I have a lot of relationship with certain pastors in the peninsula, um, Tongan pastors in the Methodist church and the AOG churches. Um, but a lot of those places are the places that I tend to go to with outreach of the Pacific Island community um, because um, there's a good um, large population of uh, Pacific Islanders that, um, that trust the community faith uh, communities, or community faith Leaders. Yes, yeah. faith-based yeah. communities. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you mentioned Tongans in the Methodist Church. Yeah. There's no specific religion because I was thinking of Pacific Islanders in terms of Mormons. Mm -hmm. So they, it, it's across the board in terms of religious participation, is it? Yeah. So uh, when I say Pacific Islanders, there's, there's a lot of groups that fall under that. For um, example, for example, give us an Samoans, idea. Tongans, um, Chamorro in, in Guahan and Guam. Um, Hawaiians? Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians. So m the reason why we say Native Hawaiians is because um, those who are Hawaiians by, um, by um, who are born ha Native Hawaiian, they're indigenous to the United States. So we say Native Hawaiian, um, not because people are from Hawaii, but because they're, um, they are descendants of Hawaiians. So and that's that why we would say kind of Hawaiians. exclude perhaps Obama's mother who um, native Hawaiians aren't you're not talking about people who might have served in the military who moved to Hawaii yeah so I'm talking it's it's referring to indigenous uh, right. people from Hawaii so so that's why when you look at the census it says native Hawaiians um, specifically on those uh, on the on the race and ethnic category um, yeah but for for specific for Mormons Catholic <laughs> I think the, some of the churches that um, a lot of Tongans uh, attend here in the peninsula is uh, Mormon churches, Catholic churches, uh, Methodist churches, and uh, I think some Wesleyan churches, but, and uh, a couple non-denomination churches. So you know it's interesting we're talking about how communities will lose money and President Trump has just issued his budget mm -hmm. and that budget has the biggest cuts are in social services. Mm -hmm. So it's precisely the programs that we're sitting here talking about that people are entitled to. And what do you say for those opponents who talk about entitlements that people shouldn't feel that they are entitled to and there should be a cutback in terms of entitlements? How, how do you respond to that? You know, the entitlements people think of in terms of welfare. Well, those programs are supposed to be safety nets. No one should go hungry uh, to bed at night. No one should be without health care, you know, insurance or coverage. Uh, this country is, you know, the, the wealthiest country in the world. I think that it, it's, it's a matter of taking care of your fellow Americans. That's what it's about. And so I strongly feel that uh, I don't see it as an entitlement. I feel it, it's just taking care of your people. And when you say your people, you mean all people? All people, All yeah. people. Yes. Well, you know, I think if, the, if people really felt that way, taking care of people, you wouldn't have homeless in the streets. Right. 
right? Correct. So Jonathan, in terms of entitlements, do you come across people, those that you've worked with, who are afraid, other than public charge, who just originally, I mean ordinarily say, well, that sounds like welfare and I don't want to take welfare and therefore they do without services or do, what's the mentality, the different types of mentalities that you run into? I mean, I guess there's a little bit of everything. Um, it's just a wide spectrum. I mean, each person is different. Um, but I mean, I think the, you know, you were talking about earlier, the people that talk about the entitlement, I think, um, I think they're already using the wrong word to begin with. I don't think entitlement is actually even uh, the right word because I would say that you have to meet certain requirements to get certain kinds of aid. And so you have to show this and therefore it's like applying for any other process. So, um, And I no one is entitled or people are entitled or, so let's break that down in terms of natural, perhaps God given rights. You know, people would say it's a right to have a home. It's a natural right. And so entitlements, how would you define it? I mean, if entitlement isn't a w the proper word. I just think entitlement might give a, a wrong connotation, I think. Um, I think it's, uh, like Ruben mentioned a little bit ago, is we're all humans. Um, all the rules, all the regulations, it, it's things that we created. And so, you know, the way I explain it to a lot of people, because sometimes, especially right now, is a lot of people have strong opinions about immigration law, is I say, if someone comes knocking at my door asking for something, I'm going to sleep at night if I'm, if, uh, if I help them. If I don't help them, I'm probably not going to be able to sleep at night. And so that's just what I think, but, um, you know, different people feel differently. Right. So I think... Um, Maybe that's why you're doing what it is that you're yeah. doing, right? And I mean, I so tell you them, can sleep better at and night. I tell them it's, and I tell them it's okay. Um, it's perfectly fine to agree to disagree. Um, and so it just it's just whatever people... You know, whatever helps them sleep at night. I mean, there's there's um, two sides, you know, of of, of every coin, and so, um, you know. Are you sure there's just two sides? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a the lot edge. of sides. Yeah, well, for us, there are no sides. It's it's everything's in the gray area. But I mean, just me personally. I mean, sure. it's it's that's all I tell people is I think of it as someone's coming and knocking on my door and and asking for something. I'm just gonna. Um, you know, my, my values is just, I'm just gonna, I'd rather give than, than not give, and so. Walter, what enables you to sleep better at night? Are you doing this so you can sleep better <laughs> at night? I, th I think what enables me to sleep better at night is when um, I'm serving uh, my community the best I can, um, knowing that um, I'm participating in some good work, um, advocating for justice for our community and getting people counted. I think that um, that adds a little to uh, my good sleep at night. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, there's so much to be done. Yeah. A lot of people are going kind of sleepless because <laughs> 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 they haven't solved the problems, huh? Yeah. yeah. It's so a journey. It's a journey. It's mm -hmm. a journey. So it's not the destination, it's mm -hmm. the journey. That's right. Yeah. It's the journey in terms of the senses. How would you define that journey? <laughs> <laughs> We're starting March 1st, sending out the cards. March 12th. March 12th, mm -hmm. you're right. So when I said, how would you define that journey, you were going to say something. It's, it, it's, it's hard work, and it, it gets stressful at times. But when you see the fruits of it at the end, it reminds you of the purpose of your work, right? And I think that's, for me, um, uh, what's, that's what community organizing is all about, is when you, there's a sense of uh, desire, a sense of purpose, um, that you ha a sense of drive that you have in, in you. And when you're out there doing community work, and you know, for in this context, uh, t content is like doing census work. When you're doing that work, it, it gets stressful, it gets, you know, you lose, you lose some sleep, but when you see for the next 10 years and how this is gonna benefit 
even some of us that have kids, how old you're going to be in the next 10 you, years, right? It, it seems to me you haven't seen it yet, but yeah. you, you believe. You believe. Huh? And I think that's what faith is because you see something that does not exist yet, right? So you see um, how these resources are going to benefit our next generation. Or you believe. You believe You it. believe mm -hmm. that it's really going to benefit. Yeah. And that's what gives you a sense of drive to do community work, for at least in my perspective. Sure. Now, yeah. who is it? You? It was Jonathan who talked about sleeping at night. So, Reuben, <laughs> <laughs> what enables you to sleep well at night? <laughs> Knowing that I'm, I'm making a difference, mm -hmm. I believe in, in, in um, you know, making this world a better place and whatever I can do uh, to make it a better place, I'm going to do. Uh, I feel like I have to leave a mark. I don't, I don't want to leave this world in the future and, and, me, and leave it and not have a meaning, and have a purpose of, of, of doing something important. And that's why, what, that's what keeps me going is the 20 plus years I've been a job trained doing the census work mm -hmm. is understanding like Walter said is that we believe that this work is meaningful in that it's going to have impact, you know, hopefully a positive impact in our society going forward that uh, children will not go hungry uh, at school, you yeah. know, uh, families will be able to get uh, medical care We'll be able to get uh, better roads. To, we can, drive, uh, you know, that, that then, you know, and get our roads improved. Uh, you know, we can get uh, things will be better for us. Is what I hope this this will do, uh, in in the work that we're committed to do right now with the census. Well, that's what I hear from you. It sounds like a real passion, in in terms of that you really believe that getting people counted for the census is going to make a difference in their lives in the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen that, have you, with prior censuses? I guess you can say censuses. <laughs> censuses. <laughs> well, I wasn't as involved as I am uh, this time around. Um, in the past, I was working directly with the census and accommodating their needs for classroom space, for training, and uh, helping them, you know, uh, promote the, the importance of the census. But this time around, it, I'm, I'm, I, I'm probably very deeply involved in it now. Um, and uh, I feel strongly about it now because of the political climate and and and, it's, and and the repercussion it can have. You know, we do it great; that's a positive result. If we don't do it, it can have definitely a long-lasting negative impact on, on on our community. Well, I I would certainly think when you look at the political climate now, depending on what side you're on, <laughs> um, getting people counted really makes a difference yeah. if you believe in the purpose that the census and, and will <clears throat> affect all of the different things that we talked about, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even independent of, you know, people's um, political beliefs, 10 years is a long time. Um, if you, you know, count 2020 on, that's at least, you know, um, at least two different, or at least one different president, depending on what happens. But um, even then, you know, it's it's a long time, ten years, and so um, you know, the count right now. Essentially, this is something that is actually in the Constitution. A lot of people don't know is that um, you know when the forefathers drafted this, they said, okay, how can we uh, make the government work for the people? And so one of the things empower was empower people, empower people, but also is we want to know how many people we need to serve because I think a lot of people now, especially with what's going on, um, you know, the government's supposed to serve the people and that's why this country was was um, founded. And so er it's everyone's right to be counted regardless of, you know, age, sex, uh, gender, um, you know, immigrant status. And so that's that's kind of what we're trying to, to just get everyone counted. I mean, regardless of anything. When you talk about empowering people, Mm -hmm. and trust, the level of trust now is very low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how would participating in the census do you think? First of all, it's going to take a lot of trust for people to fill out the census and submit it for many people. But how do you think participating in the census will affect the level of trust that people will have or will it?
I think pe we have to be able to help people understand uh, the impact, the implications, the, the benefit. And uh, like, uh, like Jonathan said, you know, it's not immediate, the, the, you know, participating, the results we'll have. But, it, but uh, it, if, if we all believe that there's going to be a long-term benefit uh, that if, you know, I may not see it in 10 years, but maybe my grandchildren will benefit from you know, the, the effort we, go, we make to make sure that people participate in the census. And so yeah. you have to kind of help people see that vision of what the future yeah. may, may provide for us if we all you know, do our part and uh, do the census. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, one of the hard to count populations from, from 2010 were kids that from zero, from, from one to five. And if, if, there's an, like, if there's an increase of a population between that age group, in that age group, then there will be proper allocation for services that serve that, 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 that age group. Um, and so when we think about that hard to count uh, population, kids, right? And then we think about our kids, I don't have kids, but if people, we get to people to make uh, the census uh, connect with people by saying, by highlighting the uh, specific uh, resources that impact the kids and how old they will be for the next, you know, um, as we go to 2030, how old will they be and what type of uh, schools will they be in mm -hmm. and what type of communities are we imagining for them. When we make that connection, it'll empower them to uh, participate uh, in the 2020 census. Any um, connections we haven't made in the time remaining that you would like to make? Can you repeat that question one more time? Oh, mm. <laughs> you talked about making the connections, mm -hmm. and so I was saying any connection that we haven't made in terms of the, sentence, the census and its importance that you might like to make. 30 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> please, the countdown is please beginning. Please participate. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's painless. Yeah. It, it's, it's painless. Ten Everyone, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes, yeah. ten years. People yes, understand that. and whether you vote or not, you can be counted in the census, That's right? right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. count. Yeah. Everyone counts. Everyone yeah. counts. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great note to end on. Um, everybody can participate. Everybody can count. Everybody does count. Whether they feel they count or not, they do. <laughs> Thank you so and much. And there's lots of help out there. And there's lots of help. Thank you for being here to talk about it. Um, and I'd like to thank the viewers for watching. Until next time.